Welcome to CS159, Data Driven Algorithm Design. Today it is a great pleasure to have Felix Birkenkamp give the lecture. Uh, we're very grateful that Felix is doing this at such a late hour since he's uh, joining us from Europe. Uh, Felix uh, is an expert in data exploration, reinforcement learning, and controller optimization. Some of his research has been applied uh, on hardware for safe optimization of quadcopter drones and other applications as well. And today he'll be giving an overview of that area of research. Take it away, Felix. Right. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction. So as uh, was said, so the topic for today is safe exploration for reinforcement learning. And maybe to start, um, let's quickly recap kind of what's reinforcement learning. So I guess you've seen this now many times as part of the lecture. So reinforcement learning just means you have some environment that you interact with. You get to choose actions, AT. So you're the agent and based on your actions, you get to see kind of what next state you end up in and a certain reward. Right? And this framework has become extremely popular over, I guess, the last decade, um, where it's been used to solve really challenging games, most or simulations in um, kind of phenomenal things that were not thought possible before, such as playing Go or playing Atari from Pixels, which would have been completely unimaginable um, a couple of years prior. So the goal here is always to maximize, or usually to maximize the sum of expected rewards. So you're kind of trying to pick actions in order to get as much reward as possible. And in order to do so, you have to balance two things. On the one hand, you want to exploit. So if you found an action that gives you a really high reward, you kind of want to keep doing this. And on the other hand, you have to also explore, right? Initially, you don't know what kind of environment you're interacting with. And so you have to figure out which actions to take. So this is a really nice and general framework, but maximizing the sum of expected rewards is not always the natural thing to do. So for example, um, you've already seen this as part of the, um, the lecture. Um, there are applications in medicine where you might actually injure the patient if you just explore randomly. Right? And that's not something that you can actually apply in medicine if there's a risk of actually hurting the patient during your kind of reinforcement learning optimization run. Similarly, there are a lot of applications in um, robotics where the system is kind of inherently unstable, which means that if you don't do anything, um, your system might break or crash. So for example, think of this flying robot, so a quad rotor. If you actuate that in a wrong way, so if you pick kind of random policy parameters or even random actions, then you're eventually gonna crash the robot. And that means you have to build a new robot and repair it. And that means kind of your experiment is over, right? By the time you've rebuilt the robot, it's gonna be so different that you can restart your reinforcement learning algorithm. So the um, last example is if you actually go to large real world systems. So this is um, an example from Switzerland where they're building, um, so they're having a huge um, basically particle accelerator um, and that's extremely expensive, but you still have lots and lots of parameters in these machines that you want to tune. And we want to use reinforcement learning algorithms to solve this problem because it's not always intuitive kind of how to manually tune these parameters. But then again, you really don't want to break the machine. Right? So if you actuate them the wrong way, you can lose kind of containment. And I think it's like a huge process to then reset the machine and start from scratch. So all of these applications kind of have in common that they have some kind of safety critical component. So you want to use reinforcement learning to solve them as good as you can. But on the other hand, you really don't want to break your system or injure the patient or break the robot during the experimentation. And so as this leads to the question of how can we actually learn to act safely in these kind of unknown environments? So if somebody gives you the system and tells you to optimize this without breaking it, how can we actually do that in practice? And so the lecture is gonna roughly follow this outline. So we're gonna start um, with just a quick recap of what presumably you've seen in lecture two, so Bayesian optimization. And then we're gonna start thinking about what can safety actually mean in this context, or and how does it relate to kind of the reinforcement learning problem that I just talked about. Then we're gonna think a bit about the key ideas behind safe exploration with Gaussian processes. So not really aiming to optimize anymore, but just kind of trying to figure out how to safely explore given a Gaussian process model. And so the goal here is really to get an idea behind how the algorithms work. So it's not so much kind of trying to dive directly sort of deep into the theory. And I'm gonna present some parts differently than they might show up in the paper. But if I do so, I'm gonna point out so that hopefully 
at the end, you kind of have an idea of how these methods work, and you can actually go out and read the paper and kind of understand how these things work. And so then we're going to take a next step, and we're going to think about how does this actually now work if we want to not only explore, but also optimize at the same time. And so in the end, we're going to briefly touch on various extensions about how this can kind of lead to quote unquote kind of full reinforcement learning. So let's start with a kind of a big, a quick Bayesian optimization recap. So you've already seen this. Um, our goal is to maximize some function, which I'm going to call J. Um, it's going to be clear in a second why. And we want to pick some parameters from a sp um, space D. So I'm going to call them theta in order to maximize this function. So that's just a generic optimization problem that we would like to solve. And so we're going to kind of design also a generic um, algorithm for this, which kind of proceeds in iterations where at each iteration we select certain parameters, theta t, and then we get to see how they perform. So we get to see an evaluation of j of theta t perturbed by this noise epsilon t. And we want to iterate this in order to solve this optimization problem up there. So the challenge here is that we don't know this function ahead of time. So if somebody gave you j, you, and you could, for example, compute gradients, and you could evaluate it really efficiently, then you just might want to evaluate it everywhere, right? Or do some um, kind of evolutionary methods or something that kind of doesn't, might evaluate the function a lot of times, but doesn't really bother you if you have the function. But in this setting, we don't know the function. So we can't compute gradients and we certainly can't evaluate it lots and lots of time. So for example, here evaluating J might correspond to like a core experiment on the robot. So we don't want to do this a lot. And so the second challenge is there's um, some kind of noise involved. So every time we kind of evaluate the same parameters, if we do that, we still get to see different results because there's this noise acting on it. And this distinction between the two is often called um, kind of the function, uh, the unknown function that's often referred to as structural or epistemic uncertainty. So it's uncertainty that's always there and we can learn about it, while the noise is aleatoric uncertainty and kind of every time we evaluate, we're gonna get a different value. So it's not something we can learn, it's just a random perturbation. And how can we now kind of leverage this uh, in order to actually solve this optimization problem? And what we're gonna use here in Bayesian optimization is we're gonna use a well-calibrated statistical model. So that kind of both models this um, epistemic part as well as the aleatoric uncertainty and can learn about the function J as we see more and more observations of YT. So, not sure if you've come across the term well calibrated. So what does it mean? Um, so in general, it just means that um, the statistical model that you're building puts enough probability mass on the kind of true function. And in general for us, that means, uh, since we're gonna mostly deal with Gaussian processes, it means that the confidence intervals um, of this Gaussian process um, is gonna contain the true function with high probability. So for example, here's a plot of a Gaussian process. So you can see in gray the true function that I'm kind of getting observations from. The data points that I've seen so far are the blue crosses. And based on this data, I predict with a Gaussian process um, what my current belief over the function is. So you can see the, the marginal kind of distribution is the, um, we have the um, blue line is the um, mean posterior distribution. And then the shaded region kind of corresponds to our confidence interval. So again, here blue line is the mean. So after t data points or t minus one data points, um, I predict this mean for the parameters theta and there's some confidence interval attached to it. And that's the sigma t minus one. So that's the standard deviation of a Gaussian process um, scaled by some scalar beta t. And so depending on how I choose beta t, um, the probability of the true function being contained might increase or decrease. So formally, what we are trying to say is that the uh, a well-calibrated model means that the difference between the mean and this fu true function j of theta that we don't know is kind of bounded by the predictive uncertainty of a Gaussian process model. And in particular, we want this to hold for all parameters theta within our domain and for, uh, for all iterations. And so this is a really technically difficult thing to actually prove. Um, so I can refer you to the paper um, down there. So this is the um, paper that Kind of introduced GPUCB and also I think was on the first or one of the first papers to actually show that you can kind of build these um, kind of continuous confidence intervals for non parametric Gaussian process models. So it's kind of interesting, but it's technically really, really challenging. And so we're just going to assume for the rest of the talk that somebody gives us a well calibrated model. 
Now this seems maybe like an innocent assumption, but if you actually go out and apply Bayesian optimization algorithms or safe Bayesian, algor um, Bayesian optimization algorithms in practice, and they don't work, then the reason is gonna be this assumption. All right, so it really kind of means that you kind of still have a bit of prior knowledge because you can design a prior over the functions that fulfills this, pro um, this property. And at the same time, it needs to be useful enough um, in order to actually allow you to learn it. So there's a bit of a trade-off about here in kind of how conservative you're going to design your prior and how data efficient you're going to be. Okay, so we're going to assume that we have this well-calibrated model. So how can we then use this? So here's an example where I've kind of already started with one data point. And we can now use these confidence intervals to actually optimize the function. So here the GPU CB algorithm um, would always pick the parameters that have the maximum upper confidence interval. And if you iterate these algorithms, eventually you kind of converge to the optimum. And we've seen this through the lecture, kind of you can actually prove guarantees about this in terms of cumulative regret, um, which also kind of imply simple regret. So kind of eventually you're kind of evaluated parameters close to the optimum and also eventually you will most of the time evaluate parameters that have function values close to the optimum value. All right, so much for um, kind of Bayesian optimization recap. How does this relate to um, uh, reinforcement learning? So we started with this picture of like choosing actions and interacting and rewards. And then suddenly we switched to Bayesian optimization, which just has a scalar objective. It might not be obvious how the two relate. So let's say somebody gives you this robot and um, designs a policy. So this policy might depend on parameters theta. And these are the thetas that you actually get to choose and optimize in order to improve performance. And you maybe have a reference trajectory that you want to follow. What you can do now is you can try out one specific set of parameters theta t, and you get to z observe the trajectory that follows. And now you can map this kind of back to the Bayesian optimization setting um, by just writing it as an optimization problem, right? So for each parameter theta, I can do a rollout, I can see the trajectory, and I can evaluate um, how good this trajectory is. So I quantify numerically whether it's a good experiment or, uh, or a bad one. And that's now exactly the optimization problem that we want to solve. So our goal here is to do this with relatively few but noisy experiments. And so this is just the standard reinforcement learning set. So what about safety? Right? So far, I've just talked about reinforcement learning and expected reward. So how can we kind of incorporate safety and what might safety even mean? And so before I get to the setting that we're going to talk about, I want to kind of quickly highlight that there's one setting that might be interesting also, but that we will not talk about in this lecture, which is robustness. So robustness is um, kind of distinct from safety, depending on who you talk to, or it is a kind of safety. Um, so the goal there is not to find the optimum as it is a normal Bayesian optimization, but you want to find an optimum that's robust to perturbations. And so for example, um, rather than optimizing J directly, J of theta, there might be some external variable C that the function also depends on. And you might have kind of some distribution over these functions. You might want to optimize this as a stochastic um, robustness. You might also kind of go one step further and actually do some kind of worst case scenario where you can kind of pick any C within some small domain. And lastly, kind of their distributional um, methods, kind of an extension of the stochastic method where you can actually have uncertainty about the distribution um, that is acting on C um, as well. So here's a uh, um, plot from one of these uh, of the papers here at the bottom. So it's the third one from the uh, distributional robustness. And you can see that um, the left optimum kind of the, would be the kind of robust stochastic optimum. So it's kind of a, a wide optimum because kind of we have this distribution P acting on it. And then kind of the star is the distributionally robust way, um, version where you also might have some uncertainty about the distribution. And then kind of you prefer wider optima over kind of very sharp local peaks um, of optima. So this is one notion of safety that you might want to encounter. And did I encourage you to kind of look at the papers if that's a setting that interests you? But it's not the setting that we're gonna talk about in the um, lecture. So what we're gonna talk about is actually safety constraints. So what do I mean is like, so we have this robot and we want to fly and there might be an obstacle. So it might be some wall that we need to pass, but we don't wanna crash into. And so that you could encode this into the function J, but it's often really, really tricky. So now you get into the whole reward shaping problem and it's generally gonna be fairly tricky. So it's more natural often to model these as constraints. What I mean by this is that you have this trajectory and you want to make sure that a function of all these states kind of 
is greater than zero. So for example, the minimum distance of your trajectory to this obstacle should be greater than zero. And we're gonna write this as G of theta because it's inherently a property of theta. Um, but it might, if you do reinforcement learning, it might also just depend on the trajectory, but the trajectory depends on the parameters theta. So still there are kind of two settings that we have to now distinguish in this constraint setting. So one is you might just want to find a safe solution. Right, so you might want to uh, maximize the function j of theta, um, and we want to find parameters theta that fulfill this constraint. Right, so this is one notion of safety. It's not safety during the experiments, but it means we eventually kind of want to find a solution that satisfies constraints. And so there's been this paper, I think it's more or less the only paper that really considered this um, setting from 2014. And um, it's also not the setting that we're going to talk about. So what are we going to talk about? Um, so in the previous setting, safety um, is satisfied for the solution, uh, but it can be violated during the optimization. So what we are going to talk about in this lecture is all about gonna, um, satisfying safety constraints during the entire optimization process. So not just kind of uh, in the end, but actually for all parameters that we evaluate, we want to guarantee that we don't violate this constraint. Let's make this very explicit. So we have some system that we're interacting with, we get to pick parameters that influence the behavior of the system, for example, a control policy or kind of any other parameters that um, you might want to optimize. Um, based on these, you get to see how well you did. So for example, you might do a rollout or you might just have a function that you can evaluate and you get to kind of see a noisy reward. At the same time, you can evaluate um, kind of what's the constraint. So did I violate the safety constraints that I had imposed? And these are also noisy observations because the system itself might be stochastic. And then we get to iterate, right? So based on these observations, we get to pick new parameters theta t. And as a normal reinforcement learning, our goal here is to maximize the performance, but we now have the safety constraints um, g of theta. Um, but actually we're gonna go one step further and we also want to guarantee safety for all parameters that we actually evaluate. So any parameter theta t, we want to make sure that the safety constraints are fulfilled. So one of the important thing here to notice is that we define safety with respect to um, g of theta, so the function without the noise. So that means even though we guarantee safety, the noisy evaluation of the constraint might still be violated. It's actually pretty easy to include that um, in the optimization algorithms if you really cared about this. But we're gonna really focus on g of theta t for now. All right, so we finally arrived at a kind of a, the constraint optimization problem. And so we're gonna spend a decent amount of time looking at plots like these. So if you don't understand them, uh, ideally ask now. So um, at the bottom on the horizontal axis, you can see the parameters theta. So these are the parameters that we get to pick. And then the lower um, plot, um, there's the safety constraint, g of theta. And then on the top, we see the performance. And these are two separate functions that are kind of given by the environment, but we don't know them in advance. And um, there's a safety constraint. So we don't want to evaluate any um, parameters theta that lead to values g of theta below this line. So um, let's see if I can, so kind of here in this region here, um, we don't want to evaluate, this region is fine to evaluate, and this region we can't evaluate. Okay, so we've already kind of made the assumption that we have a well calibrated model for J of theta, because we can do Bayesian optimization. So we're gonna make the same assumption for G of theta. So we can somehow build a statistical model that allows us to make predictions um, about G of theta. And so in the absence of any prior knowledge, that's just gonna look like this, right? I don't know anything. So any parameters theta might lead to any value um, of G of theta and J of theta. Now this is a bit of a problem. We started out with a setting where we said, we really want to ensure that for any parameters, so also the first parameters that we try, that safety is guaranteed. But now in the absence of knowledge, I don't really know what to do. So kind of graphically, somebody gives you some system, for example, a quadrotor just tosses you the remote and you've never flown a, a kind of robot or quadrotor before and you're asked to control this safely. And most likely that will not work the first try. So the problem here is that without any prior knowledge, it's really impossible to safely control an arbitrary system or safely optimize um, an arbitrary function that you don't know in advance. So there needs to be some kind of prior knowledge. And the way we're gonna 
assume this prior knowledge is available is that somebody just tells you a safe starting point. So somebody who is maybe an expert pilot tells you, look, um, here's roughly the parameters that you need to configure in your controller and then the system is gonna work somewhat okay. So it's not gonna fail, it's also not gonna work great, it's just a starting point. So there's no assumption on the performance, it just means that it's safe. So what does this look like? So we give them one data point. So somebody has told us this particular parameter where we made the blue cross, this one is safe and we've evaluated it and we've seen these um, particular values. So this is now already useful, right? Because if we look at the confidence intervals, so the blue shaded region, we know that this true function, the gray underlying function G is contained in this confidence intervals. That means kind of this set here, this, this red set at the bottom um, where um, the lower confidence interval is above the safety threshold, we kind of know that any of these parameters, at least under the assumptions that we've made in our model, are gonna be fine to evaluate. Any parameters theta in this set are with high probability will have function values g of theta above the safety threshold. This is already great, right? We've made progress. We can now actually have a choice of which parameters to evaluate. Now the question is, which ones should we pick? Right, and this is what we're gonna spend, at, I guess, the next 20 minutes or so at least, um, kind of thinking about how should we now pick parameters in order to um, kind of learn about which parameters are safe. And for this, we're gonna really leave um, behind um, the notion of optimization, and we're just really gonna focus on the safety constraint for now. So we'll return to kind of the full Bayesian optimization setting, but it really pays to now fully understand what's happening um, when we try to learn about safe sets. So the first kind of algorithm that you might um, consider um, is to just kind of pick the most uncertain parameters in this set. Right? So this is kind of known as active learning. And I'm not sure if you've seen this, but if you pick the parameters that have the largest standard deviation within some fixed set, and you do this often enough, you eventually know that you're gonna cover the set. So it's actually known to be a really efficient exploration algorithm if your goal is to learn about the function um, everywhere, right? For every parameter, you want to decrease the uncertainty. So you're really aiming to decrease the maximum uncertainty. So this um, kind of formally would look like this. So basically at each iteration um, uh, T, um, we pick the parameters that have the maximum uncertainty. So where this blue shaded region is the largest, but within this red set. And so this is the second constraint here, which means that the probability that G of theta is greater than or equal than zero is greater than some threshold, so one minus delta. Um, so for example, if we pick delta to be 0 0.01, we want a 99% um, probability kind of that we always fulfill the safety threshold. And so the way this actually would be implemented is since we already made the assumption that the confidence intervals contain the true function g of theta with the same probability, it's just gonna boil down to all the parameters where the lower confidence threshold is above the line. So we're just doing active learning constrained to the um, safety setting. And so this is, basically the key idea behind the safe active learning algorithm um, from this paper here. So let's see how this actually works. So I hope the video kind of works um, and you can kind of see it. So you can see here this purple line, which is the parameters that it picks uh, to evaluate next. And then you can see kind of it keeps evaluating the, um, the points. And then um, once it's evaluated that, computes the posterior new posterior distribution over the function and kind of keeps doing this for however long I've set this. I think 25 iterations and then it stops. So this is already nice, right? We've actually learned about the safe set. You can see that this red region here at the bottom, it started out being very small, right? And by actively learning about the function everywhere, we eventually kind of found, a, found the largest safe set, right? You can see that the true function actually dips below the safety constraint here and here. So kind of what we found is actually somehow the largest safe set that we possibly could have hoped to find in the setting. And so it's already great, right? So it's an algorithm that works, but it's also not super satisfying because we've now kind of evaluated a lot of parameters that were not really necessary to learn about the safety of parameters. So if we kind of look at this again, kind of the, the first couple of uh, iterations start out being great, right? Like we're always evaluating on the boundary of the safe set. That seems really useful if we want to kind of expand the safe set. But then this evaluation here, so iteration nine, you can, can, um, can kind of see that this is now not useful. But an evaluation here is unlikely to provide as much information about the parameters here. Right? So it's just 
under the um, kind of the kernel at least that we've chosen for this. So the problem here is that kind of these parameters are not useful to learn about the safety. So how can we avoid evaluating these? Uh, that means we kind of have to make a modification to our algorithm. So one idea would be to only actually explore, explicitly explore on the boundary of the safe set. So for example, we might want to quantify some kind of distance from the boundary of the safe set. So here, um, what I mean by this um, notation is for each parameter theta, so this line here, we kind of compute the minimum distance, so some kind of distance metric. So it's not really, it can, for now, just consider it to some kind of notion of distance. And we kind of find the closest unsafe parameter, so the closest parameter we don't know that it's safe yet. And this is now some kind of distance metric that we could use to evaluate whether we are close to the boundary of the, um, the current safe set. So what we could do is we could constrain our algorithm to only evaluate parameters on the boundary. So for example, we could, in addition to kind of selecting the maximum uncertain element, we could constrain parameters to have distance to the boundary of the safe set smaller than some kind of constant C. Right, and this would be then this magenta or purple or whatever that color is set here, um, which are all the points that are somehow close to the boundary. So before we see how that actually works, uh, so a quick aside. So if you actually look at the papers that I will kind of show you later, um, they will kind of write this quite differently. And so, um, so, so first off, so these points kind of that um, on the boundary, we usually call them expanders because they are more likely to expand the safe set than other parameters. But so in, in theory, um, people actually do something slightly different from this distance or have a very peculiar notion of this distance. Um, where they usually, you will see something like this. And it's not super essential um, for the lecture, but in case you look at the paper, I just quickly wanna point out what this means. So you um, can actually go out and read these papers if you want. Um, so here kind of they define this distance as the upper confidence interval of some parameters theta. Um, so this is kind of some point here along the um, upper line of um, our uh, confidence interval. And then they subtract from it some um, kind of constant L. So this ideally would be the Lipschitz constant of the true function um, minus some norm or some metric. So if written here is a norm and that needs to be greater than zero. And what this means is that um, for each parameter theta, uh, you kind of take the upper confidence interval, uh, you kind of ex um, using kind of this additional knowledge about the Lipschitz continuity of the function, you kind of look whether um, there is an unsafe point um, where kind of just given the continuity of the function, you know that uh, you can't really, um, the function value needs to be above this. So it's just a kind of mathematical hack to kind of make sure that you um, don't evaluate, exclude parameters that could potentially expand the safe set, but it requires additional knowledge L. And so if you implement this in practice, you would probably just think about evaluating close to the boundary of the safe set. Um, so, so your example here, so this kind of purple line, there is an unsafe point where um, the distance is greater than zero. If we take a point that's kind of further inside the safe set, we can see that there are no unsafe points where um, we can kind of learn about the, um, the safety. And so this point on the right would not be in the expanders, the one on the left would be. Okay, let's go back to the algorithm. So now um, we're still doing active learning. But now we're constraining ourselves to evaluating close to the boundary of the safe set. So we still have the same safety constraint, but an additional constraint on the boundary. So if we run the algorithm now, we can see that um, it starts out very similarly, kind of always evaluating on the boundary of the safe set. But then eventually, um, it just starts evaluating always on the boundary, right? Like this, it's found the maximum safe set, and it's now just going to keep evaluating on the boundary in the hope of ever ex um, expanding the safe set. So this is already much nicer. I mean, we're still evaluating a lot on the boundary, okay, but we've already come a lot further, right? We're now not wasting a lot of data points evaluating the function at parameters that might not help us expand the safe set. Felix, quick question. Yeah? Uh, these, these definitions, um, they're not equivalent, these different definitions? Or are they? Um, well, so if I just say it can be any distance from the boundary of the safe set, I mean, you could potentially exclude parameters that 
um, are not uh, that potentially could help you learn about the safe set. Right. So you still need to make sure if you really want to go through the theory, you need to make sure that you don't exclude parameters that ultimately help you to learn. I see. So you want the tightest region. You want a definition of distance that gives you the tightest region that encapsulates the expanders. Yes. Okay. Right, so that's what you um, need for the theory. But I mean, ultimately, this expander set is always kind of some over approximation of the premise that we should actually evaluate somehow. Right, it's, um, it's never going to be um, like a, a perfect thing. We just want to make sure we kind of keep all the parameters that are useful for learning about the safe set, but don't evaluate kind of function values that are not useful to learn about the safe set. So one way to do this in theory is, yeah, to use the continuity argument. In practice, you might also just generally think about distances to the safe set because ultimately that's our goal, right? Evaluate on the boundary. Um, that's kind of the inherent intention behind these expanders. Okay, so um, the last thing now that we need, kind of need is um, some kind of stopping criterion, right? Because we've now kind of kept evaluating on the boundary of the safe set and eventually we kind of want to know, okay, we can actually stop the algorithm. So what might be a good stopping criteria? Well, we can use the predictive uncertainty of a model. So you can see here um, what you might want to add in addition to the safety constraint and kind of evaluating expanders, so points on the boundary. Um, you now um, kind of have a constraint that whichever parameters you evaluate, um, the predictive uncertainty, so the posterior uncertainty of your Gaussian process model should be larger than some threshold at Cylon. And so this is now a stopping criteria because eventually this problem will become unfeasible. So there will be parameters. There won't be any parameters where we know they're safe and they're on the boundary of the safe set and they're still uncertain enough to be worth learning about. Um, and so if you run this algorithm for some kind of set of um, uh, parameters, epsilon and C, um, we can see that we start evaluating as before. Nothing really changes. It's the same algorithm, um, but eventually we stop. Right, so there are no more parameters where we're uncertain enough in order to keep um, evaluating. All right. So um, is there some potential downside to including a safety threshold? So, uh, so an exploration threshold. Right now, we're now constrained um, the exploration to include only parameters where the uncertainty is above some threshold. But that might mean we um, might not learn the entire safe set. So what you can see here is I've changed the function that we're modeling. So here you see the gray function is um, now kind of has two peaks, so like a local optimum here and a global one there. And then in between, there's this really narrow corridor, really close to the safety threshold um, that's explicitly smaller than this epsilon here. So what will happen if we run this algorithm is um, eventually kind of we explore locally, but then eventually the parameters on the boundary are just going to be not uncertain enough to kind of bother learning about and the algorithm might terminate early. So if we include these kind of thresholds um, for exploration, that might mean we don't explore the entire safe set. So here's kind of the, in contrast, if you kind of don't include this um, threshold, so you can now see kind of it crossed out. So it's the original algorithm before. If you run this now, um, it starts the same, but it never stops exploring, right? Uh, so you can see here now, um, it kind of keeps exploring. Uh, it's going to get pretty boring for a while, so let me fast forward here. Um, but eventually here, um, kind of, it finds the next region, and we find some um, the other part of the um, kind of state space that's also safe, or the parameter space that's also safe, but that we couldn't evaluate before. So one has to be a bit careful when including these kind of exploration thresholds. They can really help um, in order to make things more efficient, um, but um, they can also mean you might not find um, some optimum. And so it totally depends on your application whether this matters or not. I would argue since kind of Bayesian optimization mostly deals with the setting where we want to be super data efficient, most of the time this will not matter, but it's just something to be aware of when we include these kind of constraints. All right, um, so the last thing, um, what about my own kind of favorite exploration scheme, right? So may, what if I want to design some kind of custom exploration scheme? So for example, I want to just define some function f of theta um, and use that as in order to drive exploration. So for example, I might have some great intuition that the parameters to the right are better and I just want to evaluate them first. So uh, quickly think, will this converge or not? Um, is this a good idea? Um, 
so if we now actually run this, you can see that the parameters here on the, we always evaluate parameters on the right. Um, so far, so good. But eventually, you kind of, I mean, it just gets stuck, right? It's just going to keep evaluating parameters on the right. So you can't just pick any random expiration scheme. But there's maybe one thing that's a little bit surprising. Namely, um, if we include um, this exploration threshold and we keep um, the same ob uh, objective, so kind of explore on the right first, um, then things actually turn out drastically different. So now I've just kind of picked an off-the-shelf kind of explore right first and I've included an exploration threshold. What you can see here is that eventually the parameters on the right actually um, kind of we've got certain enough about them and so we kind of start exploring on the right. So if you include these kind of uh, exploration thresholds, you can actually pick your favorite exploration scheme. So that's actually a nice property and if you kind of want to design um, kind of custom algorithms. All right, so we've spent a lot of time thinking about algorithms now in order to um, explore safe sets. Um, let's actually kind of quickly summarize kind of what the different properties that we looked at. So um, the first one is um, safety. So we constrained our parameters to always fulfill the safety threshold. So given the setting that we're interested in, namely safe optimization, that's really required. Right? So we need this in order to um, ensure the safety of any parameters that we evaluate. Um, the next thing we looked at is kind of a definition of expanders. So kind of parameters that are close to the safe set or parameters that might help you um, classify new parameters as safe. So these can be a little bit of a hassle to compute. Um, com uh, picking the right parameter C in practice, if you're not doing theory, but if you actually have to do this, um, requires a bit of tuning. Um, but it can actually help a lot with data efficiency. And so the last thing is um, some exploration threshold. Um, so this potentially decreases the coverage of the safe set um, because we stop exploring at some point. So this was this example where we had the long kind of small tunnel to a new region of the parameter space, but it can really help with data efficiency. And so the last thing we saw is that, um, so again, under like some mild caveats, you can actually define custom exploration schemes um, as long as you kind of include this exploration threshold. But you have to be really careful for this to still be useful. Um, so don't just go out and uh, design custom algorithms um, without really thinking about whether it's a good idea. OK, so much for um, safe exploration. Let's actually talk about safe exploration for optimization. So ultimately, we want to solve um, this optimization problem where we find the maximum of the function j of theta. So um, what we see here now is, so I've kind of set the um, j of theta equivalent to g of theta. And that just means we want to find the maximum of j of theta without ever evaluating parameters that lead to a performance below some threshold. Right, so here, safety and performance are exactly the same thing. So what could we hope to do in the setting? So we, um, we have some um, initial safe seed, so this green cross. And based on this, we can, probably hope to kind of explore this red region safely, right? We would kind of slowly evaluate parameters, slowly, slowly here to the right, safely explore, but eventually here this function dips below the safety threshold. So there's no hope kind of of exploring beyond this. Um, so what we could hope for is we can kind of get to this reachable optimum. This is quite different from the global optimum, right? So if we actually just ran unconstrained Bayesian optimization, we could actually hope to reach the global optimum, but if we constrain ourselves to always evaluating safe parameters, that might not be possible. And so there's an important distinction um, that if we do safe exploration for optimization, um, we should always compare against some kind of notion of reachable optimum, and we can't hope to find the global optimum. But for many applications, that's kind of perfectly fine. Right? So safety is actually more important than potentially finding some parameters that are better um, than the um, reachable ones. OK, so how can we combine the, um, the two methods? And so I, I think one you've already at least briefly seen. Um, and so this is the idea of um, just doing stage-wise optimization, where um, you kind of first run any of these exploration algorithms in order to learn about the safe set. And then eventually, you run normal Bayesian optimization algorithm, but constrained to be within the safe set that you've learned. So in the first stage here, we for example, um, this is kind of the last exploration algorithm with uh, safe exploration algorithm we saw. Kind of you would evaluate um, parameters that are the most uncertain. So this is um, uh, the maximum standard deviation of the parameters subject to the safety constraint, subject to 
being an expander, so being on the boundary, and subject to some exploration threshold. So you do this until this problem becomes infeasible, so until there are no more parameters that you might want to evaluate, and then you switch to normal Bayesian optimization. And that means you kind of maximize some acquisition function. So for example, you maximize the upper confidence bound um, of uh, the Gaussian process model for your parameters theta, but constrained to still having the safety uh, threshold. This is kind of a really nice um, algorithm because you can now, on the one hand, you still do safe exploration, but on the other hand, you actually leverage the power of normal Bayesian optimization. So you don't, you're not really forced to kind of think about optimization and exploration at the same time. So let's see how this actually works. Um, so ignore this green set up here. Um, that doesn't actually have any meaning in the setting. Um, but what you can see is that the algorithm starts just exploring. So it's just evaluating on the boundary of the safe set. And now um, eventually kind of it is, has explored the boundaries and then it's just gonna switch to um, just normal UCB. And in this case, actually, that just means it's gonna stick to this region here where the function has really high value. Right? And so after some initial exploration, we can just focus full on, on exploiting the function within the safe set. So it's really nice in that it splits up the two objectives um, and you don't really have to think about them at the same time. So one thing that's, um, let's not run this again. Um, one other thing that one might want to do is to not um, focus directly on um, safe exploration, um, but instead to really only explore when it's actually needed for the optimization problem, right? So the previous algorithm kind of treated safe exploration as a proxy objective, where learning about the safe set was its own goal in the beginning. And then we switched to actually optimizing the function. So one thing one might to do, uh, want to do instead is to um, st instead kind of let Bayesian the normal Bayesian optimization algorithm propose parameters and then learn about their safety. So it's kind of a, a variant of the, the previous algorithm, but kind of runs Bayesian optimization in the loop. And so in particular, the idea is to think about an optimistic safe set, so parameters that we could potentially um, classify as safe, uh, have Bayesian optimization um, propose parameters in the set, and then learn about their safety and only evaluate them um, if we know they're safe and otherwise kind of query a new point from Bayesian optimization. So this is a kind of a bit more, much more involved algorithm. So kind of here we have kind of a simple illustration. So we have all our parameters theta, so this is our parameter set. Um, we have our pessimistic safe set, so the parameters that we know are safe, the ones that fulfill the safety um, threshold. And we also have an optimistic safe set. So parameters that potentially we would classify as safe. So concretely they're, um, uh, upper bound, upper confidence bound is above the safety threshold. So they could be safe. Um, but we don't know about their safety yet. And the idea is to ask Bayesian optimization for parameters within this optimistic safe set, and then to learn about the safety of these parameters if they're not already um, known to be safe, so if they're not already in our pessimistic safe set. So that means you kind of have to plan some kind of path on how to get there, and then um, learn about kind of the safety of that path. So it's much more involved because it now kind of involves planning, which parameter, how can we get to these parameters? How can we learn about their safety? But it's kind of much more goal directed. And um, so this is kind of the, the algorithm. Um, and concretely kind of, once we, we look for expanders that could potentially tell us something about the path, um, and then uh, subject to some constraint on the exploration. So there's also this exploration constraint epsilon. And we kind of try to learn about the, um, the safety of the path. And if we, it turns out that that path is unsafe, we kind of plan a new path. Um, so if you actually run this on this simple toy example, it doesn't actually look that different um, from the previous algorithm because I mean, it's a, um, it's a very contrived uh, simple example. Um, but I'll show you an example of where um, it looks different in a second. And uh, you can kind of see that um, it kind of initially queried Bayesian optimization and then kind of started exploring first to the left to the right, but eventually it also just converges to um, evaluating parameters on the right. So when does this actually make a difference? Um, so this is um, an example plot from the paper, um, which always means it's um, the most ideal setting where you can kind of show the largest difference. So don't take this as um, this algorithm is better than the other. We'll get to an overview later. Uh, it's different. It's not better. It's just a different algorithm. 
Um, but uh, so here's an example. So if you have a relatively noisy function, you have a relatively low expiration threshold, and somehow your objective is sufficiently smooth, um, then what happens with uh, the stage-wise approach, since you really care about learning about the safe set, but the function is noisy, um, it actually takes a really, really long time um, to get below the expiration threshold. Right? And that means you kind of might evaluate a lot of points on the boundary. And this is kind of what's shown here. right? So um, you might evaluate a lot on the boundary versus if you do this goal-oriented one, you figure out that, hey, here on the left, there's actually no room for it being the maximum. So Bayesian optimization will not care about it. And here on the right, actually, um, the upper confidence bound dips below the safety threshold. So that's actually not something we can reach. So we can't plan a path through unsafe nodes for the learning. And so we'd actually focus a lot on um, just evaluating this, um, the optimum. So it would just kind of run UCB. Yeah, so, so this is, yeah. Uh, how do you choose the theta star, this target at each iteration? Is it the UCB? So this is just any Bayesian optimization algorithm. So it might be UCB, for example, might be Thompson sampling. So it's also a meta algorithm. It's a kind of- Ah, uh, I see. So think if you think of- Subroutine. It can, you can, yes, so you can think of um, stage-wise optimization uh, as kind of breadth-first exploration, where um, we kind of learn about the safe set everywhere. Um, and in that setting, goal-oriented one would be kind of like the A-star alternative, where um, kind of we actually query the Oracle and then we try to uh, learn the, about the safe set directly there, rather than kind of learn about it everywhere. Um, but we'll kind of get an overview later. So the, the last algorithm I want to talk about um, is kind of a non-meta algorithm. So it's kind of a, a funny way of talking about this because this is actually the first algorithm um, of the, the three that we're going to talk about. Um, and so far, we kind of we, treat, we split up somehow thinking about exploration and thinking about optimization. I mean, the goal-oriented one asked about query points, but then it's still only focused on learning about the safe set. So can we actually design algorithms that kind of trade off both, right? So do both at the same time. Um, and the key challenge here is that somehow these, um, we need to, for that to really work, we need to trade off both kind of expanding the safe set, so safe exploration, and another kind of exploration exploitation trade off when actually optimizing the function. Right? And these are somehow incomparable quantities to some extent, right? One thinks about volume of the safe set. Um, the other one thinks about the maximum value. So it's actually, for an algorithm to do this trade-off, we need to have a comparable quantity um, in both of those, right? We need to have the both uh, same units for kind of the Bayesian optimization part and for the safe exploration part for this to really work. And um, there is uh, kind of one way to do this. So in exploration, safe exploration, we really cared about um, the variance or the standard deviation of our parameters. So the kind of key insight uh, here is that, can we turn Bayesian optimization into a problem where we also care about the standard deviation? And there's a kind of interesting um, uh, kind of idea behind this algorithm. We still kind of just do active learning to some extent. We still just evaluate parameters that are the most uncertain. Um, but we limit ourselves not only to the expanders, but we also kind of keep track of a set of parameters that could potentially be the maximum. And then we pick the most uncertain among the two of them. And this kind of leads to a trade-off where the algorithm will kind of keep switching between exploration, um, so learning about the safe set, and kind of um, learning about the maximum. It's kind of an elegant way of combining the two. So um, it's maybe easier to understand in an illustration. So um, on the bottom here, kind of we have the typical setup where we have kind of the safe set and kind of the expanders, so the boundary of the safe set. And in addition, we keep track of this green set, which I think was also present in the previous plots, but sometimes didn't really have any meaning in them. Um, and these are all the points, basically, that could potentially be the maximum. So concretely, this means where um, the upper confidence bound um, of our function is better than the best lower bound we've seen so far. And so this is a quantification of all the parameters that could potentially um, attain the safe maximum of the function. So if we run this now, what we see is that um, kind of initially it will just evaluate parameters from either this um, expander set or from the uh, kind of green maximizer set up here. And initially kind of as before, kind of the most uncertain parameters kind of as a consequence of the 
uh, model that we've picked, so the Gaussian process model with a, um, some uh, kernel that depends on um, the distance, uh, it will evaluate on the boundary. But eventually, um, it will switch between um, kind of exploring. So the previous point was actually something here on the, um, on the boundary where we evaluated and then kind of focusing on exploitation. So finding the maximum within this green set. And we'll keep switching between the two um, because the uh, kind of sometimes um, the maximum uncertainty, uncertain point might be in the green set. Sometimes it might be in the magenta set. And we'll actually switch between doing the two. All right. So those are the three algorithms um, that kind of currently exist for safe Bayesian optimization, unless I've, uh, there are some that I don't know about. Um, so the first two are kind of meta algorithms where um, we kind of split up thinking about um, optimizing and learning about the safety. Um, and the third one is one that combines the two. Uh, and so it kind of trades off between them continuously all the time. So they have fundamentally different properties. So the stage-wise or in general meta algorithms, um, what's nice is that they kind of get these epsilon regret bounds, or so at least epsilon regret bounds for uh, whenever Bayesian optimization gets to um, pick um, the optimum. Right? So we, we know that we will eventually from the exploration scheme learn about um, um, the safe set up to some accuracy epsilon. And then within this, we know that Bayesian optimization constrained to the safe set will find the optimum up to some threshold epsilon. And so this is what I mean by epsilon regret. Um, it means kind of, we haven't kind of found the full reachable safe set, but we found it up to some confidence epsilon. Um, so one downside is that, I mean, exploration is a proxy objective. So we might potentially um, explore unnecessarily, but not always, right? It really depends on the, on the kind of problem setting that you find yourself in. Um, so goal-oriented uh, exploration is really like an extension of this uh, stage-wise where um, we only explore when it's necessary for the um, Bayesian optimization algorithm. But I mean, there's no free lunch here, right? This really comes at a cost. Um, namely, it's much more complicated to implement and it's also slower, right? Because actually as part of the algorithm, well, you'll have to do some kind of safe path planning of how do I now get to these parameters? How can I learn about their safety? So it's um, quite a bit more involved to implement and quite, uh, quite a bit more computationally heavy. But then the upshot of this is that it can actually be, um, in certain settings at least, uh, can be um, much more data efficient. And so the last algorithm is actually not a meta algorithm. So it actually trades off between safe exploration and optimization, which involves the normal exploration exploitation trade-off. Um, one thing that's also, it's unclear whether this is a bug or a feature. Um, it keeps exploring. So it, uh, that means that in terms of simple regret, it can actually do better than the other two algorithms um, because eventually it will, since it keeps exploring, eventually it will actually in the limit find the true reachable safe set. And that means you might, uh, you might also find a better optimum. So think of this example that we had where we had the local optimum and then this long tunnel and then the, um, the globe, uh, kind of the other bump with a global optimum. Um, the meta algorithms will not find this because they have this expiration constraint. Um, this last algorithm, so this, what's, which is called safe opt, um, will actually find it because it keeps exploring all the time. And so eventually it might find a better optimum. Which of these algorithms should you pick? I don't know. So it really depends on your um, your problem here, right? Like so, some there, there are lots of trade-offs um, between how to pick them. Do you care about really exploring all the time? Um, it, what's the property of your function? Um, is it kind of really noisy? Um, in which case, kind of goal-oriented might be better. Um, otherwise, kind of stage-wise can actually work really efficiently sometimes. So it's there's not really like a, a recipe for which uh, which of these to pick. Um, but I think it's uh, interesting to think about the th uh, three of them as kind of trying to solve the same problem and potential intersections of these algorithms. So this actually brings us to the end of the um, safe Bayesian optimization. Ah, so the last downside of safe opt, of course, um, I can't just have positive points here. Um, so it can actually, so safe opt uh, keeps exploring, right? So, um, so it might actually waste a lot of time learning about the safety of parameters. So it depends on what you care about. So all of, them ha all of these have pros and cons um, that are, and there's no kind of clear winner. So let's actually see some of these in action. And so 
Um, I'm going to have some videos now. I'm not actually quite sure how well this will work on Zoom. Um, so both the PDF that I think I didn't send you, um, but I can quickly post it in the chat. Um, and on the top right, you kind of see the link. Let me just quickly, uh, where's the chat? Can I post this? Uh, we can also um, we can also put the link on the course websites and the videos. Yeah, just if anyone's uh, seeing it live and the video doesn't work. So I posted the link to the PDF in the chat. Um, so hopefully, if the some of the quality is choppy, you can watch it on your own as well. Um, so this is now an example of actually running um, this last algorithm, so safe up algorithm on a quad rotor. And what you can see here uh, in the bottom right um, is kind of our Gaussian process mean prediction. So we have two parameters. Uh, controller gain one, controller gain two. So these are actually parameters that decide on how should I actuate um, this robot um, depending on the kind of current observations of the state. So it's now kind of a full reinforcement learning setting. You have some dynamic system that you're interacting with. And what you see here is, um, so we have one data point, this red point here. So this is the initial um, safe set that, um, so somebody told me good parameters in the beginning. Um, and we can see that we've now evaluated them and you can see the corresponding performance. So, and now um, what's going to happen is that we're gonna run the algorithm and we're gonna make new decisions about which parameters to evaluate, um, kind of trying to maximize the performance without evaluating parameters that actually break the robot. And so one thing to notice here, so if you uh, know a little bit of control theory and a little bit of linear systems, so um, parameters here actually have both negative and positive values. And uh, negative feedback is usually a really good idea on um, unstable dynamic systems. Positive feedback, where you kind of amplify errors, is usually a really bad idea. So there are parameters here that will actually break this robot really, really badly. So um, there's no kind of cheating of making this safe um, by assumption or by picking the parameter set. OK, let's uh, watch it from scratch again, sure. Um, so, so here are the initial parameters. We get to see our uh, Gaussian process prediction. And our algorithm kind of will kind of keep picking um, parameters that are safe according to its belief over the function. So it's posterior Gaussian process belief. And it will kind of go ahead and evaluate them directly on the system. And so you can see kind of the robot flying back and forth, um, kind of starting from the left, going to the right. So whenever it goes left to right, it's evaluating new parameters. And when it's going back, it's using the best parameters that it's uh, found so far. So there's not that much teaching going on. Um, and you can see that kind of, as we kind of build a model, eventually after like relatively few um, iterations, you actually find parameters are really, really good. So you can kind of see here, the optimized control at the bottom is kind of really stable. Um, the one that we picked initially was actually really, really bad. Um, right, and so, so this is now nice because we actually have an algorithm that can optimize parameters of, on a robot and do this in somehow in a safe way. So okay. there, um, Quick question. Um, so here you have a single tracking goal. Yes. So this was just like get from, uh, so I don't actually remember what the cost function was, but uh, something along the lines get from left to right as quickly as possible without yeah, wobbling too much, something along those lines. Right. So can you imagine like a more meta approach where like I have a family of tracking goals? Cause that, that, that's typically more common in a real system. Um, and somehow I need to do safe optimization for this entire family? Um, sure. Is that, uh, so I mean, is that a straightforward, I guess my question is, is that a straightforward extension, do you think, or is that um, more complicated? Um, so I mean, there are multiple viewpoints on this. Um, so in principle, um, so, so one thing is that um, these quadrotas have a really nice property and that their, their behavior is translation invariant. So if I move it uh, half a meter to the left or half a meter to the right, um, then it doesn't really matter for how it will behave if I tell it to go right. Um, so if you have tasks that kind of reach this goal and that goal, um, as long as they're kind of rotationally invariant, then um, I can kind of cheat the problem and uh, exploit that property to actually make one work for all of them. It's not the answer you were going for. Um, so the other one is, I mean, this becomes now a um, potentially difficult problem, right? Because you have multiple objectives and it really depends on how you combine them. Um, so you might care about 
Um, do you care about average performance across all of them? Do you care about minimum performance? Do you care about the best one, right? And to some extent, you could model this now as a multi-objective Bayesian optimization problem. Um, algorithms for this have uh, varying success. Um, or you could alternatively try to um, kind of do actual meta learning and learn a prior that's kind of good for all of them. Um, so that you can kind of run Bayesian optimization in a few steps um, to find the optimum. So it's kind of meta learning for Bayesian optimization approach. Uh, I think there's no general answer Un unless you had one concrete one in mind, then I'm happy to hear your solution. Uh, no, not, nothing super concrete, just in general, kind of interested in that question. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, I, I don't think it's an obvious answer. Okay, um, let's not look at the video again. So here's another example. So a different task. So here's a robot flying around um, this hat in the middle. Uh, and its sole purpose in life of this robot is to keep this hat somehow in the center and keep flying around it in circles. Um, and so, uh, so what's nice is it's a repetitive task, right? You can have after one um, kind of flying around, you can just restart um, at the same time. So it actually goes really quickly. It's a more difficult problem now. So we actually had have a more complex controller. And what you saw on the right was basically running this algorithm now where kind of the green set here, um, yeah, we switched colors, that's not ideal, but so the green sets now are the expanders. Um, I think the red ones are the um, the ones that are known to be safe, and then the blue one are the maximizers, I think. Um, so before I show you how that it actually worked, I mean, you could see the trajectories here on the left, like all the trajectories are tried out, then the best trajectory, which is kind of tracking the reference trajectory, so this um, black circle here, um, as well as it can. There's a question. Yes. Uh, I have a question about uh, if the environment is changing. Uh, so maybe your uh, constraint is changing a little bit. Uh, could the algorithm to uh, also fit this? Like, like, uh, like if the environment, the wind is changing? Yes. So the assumption of the model so far is that they don't change. Um, so oh, we, okay. we've kind of, we assumed a fixed function j and a fixed function theta. Okay. Um, there are multiple answers to this. Uh, I think um, one is if you look at this robustness setting, so wind is something that's actually depends on your setting, but uh, it, it, if it's inconsistent, like if it's gusty or something, then there's actually very little to learn about. Um, and then you might just want to tune parameters that are somehow robust to these. And so people have tried um, to do this. It's actually, quite tricky if you don't have control over um, over the wind, but you could in principle do these robust approaches um, to kind of find the um, controller parameters that work well for all wind settings. Um, the alternative approach, um, I mean, this is all assuming that wind is observable, right? If it's not observable, then it's just noise and you can't really do anything about learning. Um, the okay. other approach would be uh, um, to treat it as some kind of um, context. And this is exactly what we're kind of going to look at in a, um, next. So, so far, our model kind of assumes that um, we only kind of, our performance depends on the parameters theta. Right? And so typically, um, explicitly in the Gaussian process model, um, we model the covariance between two function values um, with a kernel k. Um, and I, you've seen this, right, when you talked about Gaussian processes. And this is typically some function that decays as um, the, some notion of distance um, between these uh, two parameters increases. So the idea here being that if two parameters are really close under this measure of diff uh, distance, then likely the function values will be the same. If they're further apart, um, then they're most like more likely to be different. And this is basically what allows our Gaussian process to generalize. So one nice thing that you can do is you can actually add parameters um, that you now have control over, right? You can keep your previous data set as long as you kind of know the corresponding additional parameter. And you can model that, um, include in the model that now if you change this external parameter, so this could be wind, in our setting it's going to be the speed of the robot, um, that the performance of your robot is also gonna change depending on this. And so this is uh, kind of known as contextual Bayesian optimization, and you can extend the safe setting to the setting as well. And so um, what you can see here now, so we flew the initial trajectories here at a speed of um, one meter per second. 
And now what I can do is I can increase um, the reference speed of the trajectory. So I'm kind of force the robot to fly faster. And I can see um, what effect that has on our predictions. And so kind of since we've modeled um, that kind of as distance increases between the contexts, um, we can generalize less. Was the property of the Gaussian process model. Um, we can see that the safe set uh, or the parameters for which we believe that um, the trajectory will safe decreases as we increase the speed because we haven't collected any new data. Now what you can do is you can kind of at the same time kind of uh, increase the speed and run safe um, optimization. And as you can see in the top left corner, um, on the right side in the left corner, you can see the speed and as it increases the safe set shrinks um, because we're kind of changing the settings so we need to collect new data and no, that's and uh, kind of as we collect more data, it expands again. And so the task actually becomes more and more difficult the faster you fly. And so you can see that eventually there's actually, actually very few parameters that make this robot behave in a safe way. And we've kind of, we're able to transfer knowledge from one setting to the other. This is kind of cool, right? So in a safe way, um, we started out flying really, really slowly. Um, so this is the kind of shaded robot here. And then we would generalize this um, in a safe way to a robot that flies basically at the limit of the safety constraint. So you can see it has a, a higher tracking error with respect to this reference circle. And that's because it's a harder task, right? It's actually really difficult to fly fast enough and have a really good tracking error, at least in this particular design of control strategy. So um, this is just an example of um, how Bayesian optimization can actually be used. I have, a, I have a quick application specific question. So here it's a desired trajectory, right? That you're trying to track? Yes. The trajectory includes things like velocity in it, right? So it's actually, so this is the simplest way um, that you can design a, a tracking controller. It's just a, a trajectory, so a reference point in space that moves at a fixed velocity. And then there's just a controller that tries to track that point. Ah, okay, so there's okay. nothing predictive, nothing fancy. It's literally just a so, so speed. Um, so speed. Is, so speed is built into the this tracking controller for the desired velocity. So the tracking controller actually doesn't know. Um, actually, I'm I'm not 100 percent sure whether we allowed the tracking controller to know the speed, um, but ultimately it's just a reference point that's moving um, in a circle, and we're trying to track that as good uh, as well as possible. But that is the contextual variable z. Yes. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, got it. And so by increasing the speed, we're making, so since this reference point is moving faster, the robot will now kind of lag behind more and more because it's, I mean, it's not a clever control strategy, right? Like if you really wanted to solve this well, you probably have to do something predictive or accounting for this in a proper way. All right. So um, that actually brings me to the end of uh, safe Bayesian optimization. And I just wanna, I think I have a little bit of time left. Well, actually not that much time, um, but just enough. Uh, so I, th I think I have 15 minutes more, right? That's right. Okay, great. So I just want to briefly um, highlight some extensions of this, um, which is why I think it's a really interesting problem um, because kind of the basic idea of learning about safety um, it's, it's really kind of not easy, but it's, it's kind of, you can write theory and really understand the problem in this simple banded setting. And now you can actually move this to more and more complicated settings and kind of ki try to keep the insights that you've gained from the simple setting in order to kind of go to kind of more complicated reinforcement learning settings and keep the same ideas. So historically, this is what has always happened. So kind of people started with banded algorithms um, and kind of found out, hey, we can actually, for multi-armed bandits, have these really nice strategies that kind of have no regret and they work well. And then in reinforcement learning, it's a more complicated setting. It's like a bandit that kind of somehow changes. Um, but you can actually use the same ideas or similar ideas to design reinforcement learning algorithms. So something like upper confidence bound methods or Thompson sampling also work in the reinforcement learning setting. And so I think it's a good idea to do the same thing for sa um, safe reinforcement learning to kind of really understand the simple settings and try to leverage these insights in more complicated ones. And so I, I'm not going to go in detail of this. It's more like an overview of things you might want to do. So as I said, so far we looked at the bandit setting. Right? So it's a very int not so interesting MDP potentially. So we have one state, um, which is, doesn't really matter. And like whichever action we pick, um, we go back to that state. So it's kind of a, it doesn't matter how often we evaluate it, we're still evaluating the same function. 
Um, I mean, we have infinitely many actions, so that's um, that's something, right? So we are, in, um, but it's still like a simple setting. And we had this additional safety constraint that for any parameters that we evaluate, we wanted some safety constraint to fulfill. And this would, in the MDP, this would be kind of the actions that you pick that bring you back to the state. And now, so kind of in a full Markov decision process or kind of some graph, ultimately, um, you have different states, right? So depending on your actions, you might find yourself in a different state and your objective might change. Um, but what we can do is if we know this graph, so this is somehow not the full reinforcement learning setting where the environment is unknown, but if somebody tells you um, how your system behaves, for example, I tell you how my uh, flying robot, um, what the dynamics are, um, then I can just think about the safety of states. So the correspondence might be, I tell you this is a flying robot, this is how it behaves. Um, now fly through this room, there are obstacles there, um, but you don't know where they are. All right, and then in this setting, um, so it's known dynamics, so, so the known environment, but unknown kind of safety of the environment. Um, so that's kind of the simplest extension you can think of to this uh, safe Bayesian optimization setting. You can actually use very similar um, methods in order to determine safety. So why is this more um, challenging? So think of a, a robot and some world um, that this robot is living in. So here it's living on some kind of hilly landscape and it can move about. So there's some under, underlying um, graph. And so basically if there's an arrow going to the right, it can go right. If there's an arrow going to left, it can go left. Um, so what you can see is that um, here on the right, basically only the actions only allow them to go right. When it's going downhill, eventually it can't, the robot can't drive uphill anymore. And so we have these kind of grayed out states, which means uh, we don't know about their safety yet. And so now somebody gives me my initial safe seat. Somebody tells me kind of these states here where you started, they're safe, now kind of go explore. So if we were to apply exactly the same algorithm as before, kind of learn about this set, um, ignoring kind of the graph structure, what would happen is that the robot would kind of move to the right, it would learn about the safety of the next state, turns out it's safe, it's green, so it goes there, right? It uh, figures out, hey, um, what's, hap um, what's happening to the right? Oh, that's also safe, so it moves there too. And so this uh, repeats now again, and so if, if you have a naive method, it would move there as well. And what can happen now is that it turns out that the next state there is unsafe but your robot has kind of no chance to go left anymore. Uh, so potentially a kind of catastrophic failure happens, right? And your, um, your robot might get destroyed. And so the problem here is that um, kind of this graph that I've drawn at the bottom violates one of the key assumptions that actually also most reinforcement learning algorithms make, which is uh, that kind of the system is um, ergodic. And what this means is that you can always recover um, from any actions you've made. So there's there are no states where you can kind of, you go there, you pick an action, and now you can't, can't come back to the states that you previously visited. And so this is a key problem now um, because we need to avoid these, um, these settings. So um, here's an example um, of how um, we can avoid this. I mean, somebody tells us the graph, right? And so here's one particular setting where that shows everything we know. So we have um, the graph structure that somebody gave to us. Um, we have, um, we know some nodes are safe. So in particular, um, all these green ones here are safe. Um, then um, this one here is red, uh, so this is uh, unsafe. And then here's a gray one where we don't know about the safety yet. And so the, the key idea behind these algorithms is that um, we can still do safe exploration, right? We can still use similar ideas um, to reason about um, expanders and kind of learn about the safety. Ultimately, it's still a function of the state, um, whether um, a state is safe or not. So we can use our Gaussian process model to, to learn about this, um, but we have to be certain to um, not visit states that lead to failure. And so concretely, that means um, we can't visit the state here on the right, even though we know it's safe, because the graph would force us um, to then visit a state that's unsafe. And uh, similarly, if we go to the left here, um, to this state, we would have to go to some state where we don't know about the safety yet, so we have to exclude that as well. So you can still run safe exploration, you just have to make some bookkeeping um, in order to figure out um, kind of which states uh, I can actually visit safely and with, uh, which not. So you kind of have to account for the long-term uh, dependency of actions, but then you can at least run safe exploration. 
And there are different um, algorithms now um, to deal with uh, how to deal with the optimization. Um, so uh, for example, you might want to still kind of maximize reward within this graph, um, but I'm not really um, going to talk about this uh, too much. Um, so here's sort of one um, example that actually never made it um, to paper where, but where we actually tried this. So there's um, a robot kind of dri uh, driving between uh, like in, in the plane and it basically doesn't know where these pylons are, where the obstacles are, and it's trying to, can only sense kind of the distance to these obstacles. And so it's trying to drive around in a slow way and learn about the safety. And so this is now a setting where kind of the dynamics of the robot are kind of known, I mean, it's on the ground, um, but we don't know the obstacles and we have to kind of be careful not to drive too quickly so that we crash into the obstacle because we can't brake quickly enough. There are lots of different methods. So I just gave you some references if you want to read up on this. Um, there are lots of different uh, papers that kind of consider this um, setting and like different settings of like, do I care about reward? Do I just care about exploration? Um, all these kind of things. Um, one thing that's, so this is a bit of a dropout, uh, the paper here at the bottom. So this is actually considering continuous um, dynamics or continuous world, um, but safety is unknown. So it's also an interesting paper. So the, this uh, is kind of the simplest extension you can think of. So you can just think about doing Bayesian safe Bayesian optimization on graphs. Um, of course, that's not really kind of the full reinforcement learning setting because we know um, the environment that we're dealing with. So the more complicated setting um, would be to actually do kind of a full reinforcement learning. And so in particular, I think the one that matches closest to this is to do some kind of model-based reinforcement learning. So model-based reinforcement learning works like this. You have some uh, policy, pi theta, that tells you which actions to take in which state. And then um, you do exploration. So you try out different actions on the robot. Um, based on this, you learn a model of your system and then you kind of do planning. So you use that learned model in order to optimize the policy under the model that you've learned. Now, if we wanted to do that um, safely, you have to do, change two things. So you have to learn a statistical model of the system. So again, you have to have this well calibrated assumption to not only quantify how your system behaves, but also um, what are kind of the errors in my prediction of how it behaves. And then based on these uh, errors in your model, you have to train a policy that ensures you do safe exploration. Right? So you don't violate the safety constraints that you've imposed. So um, concretely, um, we have this Markov decision uh, process, which has certain um, probabilities of moving from one state to the other. That means kind of we end up in the next state, depending on our current state, ST, the action that we've picked, and then there's some noise. So it's, it's um, potentially the continuous setting, right? so then you just have, um, but could also be the discrete setting. So that's actually you're learning the um, transition probabilities directly. So um, we can also use a statistical model to learn this function f directly. So the learn uh, kind of how a system behaves. Because I mean, ult ultimately here we've assumed it's kind of, there's some deterministic part and then there's that we can learn. And then there's the additive noise that kind of um, gives us some error in where we move ultimately. And so how can you now use the statistical model to do um, safe control? So here is now um, uh, the gray box is the set of all the states that our robot might um, potentially be in. We have some constraints again, like don't crash into the wall. So we know which states are unsafe a priori, but then we're uncertain about how our system behaves within the state space given a certain action. And so we start with some certain state as zero and now we want to make sure that whichever action we pick, even though we're uncertain about our dynamic system, we don't want to end up in the unsafe states. And again, we need some initial knowledge to do this. Right? So either you need to know the dynamics well enough or alternatively, which maps closer to better to the safe Bayesian optimization setting, somebody needs to give you some initial safe set. So for example, an initial control policy that kind of makes sure your system stays within this blue region here. So if you have this, um, then safety now can be something like this, right? So I can use my uh, model to plan ahead so plan ahead a finite time trajectory. And these ellipsoids here kind of show how uncertain you are about your prediction. Kind of the longer you predict ahead, typically the more uncertain you will get. But if you can make sure that eventually you end up in a state where you know um, that you're kind of safe, um, 
then you kind of know that uh, you can apply this sequence of actions and no matter what, under the uncertainty of your model, you will always end up in this region where you're safe. So this is now one way to incorporate a safety constraint into your optimization problem, right? Like, so you're doing normal reinforcement learning, you're optimizing for performance, but you might have this constraint that you um, get back to some initial safe set of the system. And so um, this is kind of like a safety policy. It's not super useful for reinforcement learning because it just drives you back to some potentially really boring initial safe set. So what you probably want to do is you want to combine this with some kind of other plan um, that just does exploration. So if you do model-based reinforcement learning, um, you can use your favorite algorithm. So you can optimize your policy for expected performance. So if there's an algorithm called PILCO that's uh, really famous for doing this, um, you can use optimism, you can use Thompson sampling um, in order to define an exploration strategy that learns about the system and tries to maximize performance. And as long as you can kind of guarantee that at least the first step of these two trajectories are the same, then you know that there's kind of always a backup policy um, to get back to this initial safe set. And things get, uh, so you can see it's kind of also um, kind of a, a meta algorithm to some extent, right? We are still doing normal uh, model-based reinforcement learning, kind of doing this exploration strategy, um, but somehow we are constraining things to always have this um, safety plan, backup plan. So it's actually, it's really valuable to think about this from a um, safe Bayesian optimization perspective because some of the problems are actually really, really similar. I mean, things get more complicated because you have more freedom and now you're uncertain about the dynamics and you need to predict ahead and you have long-term consequences of actions. But the key ideas of how to explore and how to potentially combine exploration and safety still remain the same. And so here's actually an example from um, some colleagues of mine uh, so at, um, at the University of Toronto. Um, who actually ran this. So what you can see here is um, a robot that's driving through these pylons. It's not allowed to hit them. And you can see here this blue triangle is kind of the current position. And then it's planning ahead um, a trajectory, kind of trying to not um, collide with these cones. So it's kind of a little bit of a different setting than the one I um, was talked about. But um, basically, this was the very first run, was was very uncertain. You could see that. Um, Kind of, it could only kind of drive very slowly because the uncertainty very quickly got close to the um, safety constraints. And now, after kind of um, a couple of iterations, so this is the third trial here. It's much more confident about the dynamics and can predict further ahead, or like is more sure about everything and can also drive faster. So the second time is actually driving faster without actually um, hitting the pylons. So this is just one example. So I think there are, there are multiple labs now that um, have done similar approaches. It's actually surprisingly tricky to make these approaches work. So it's not just kind of take your algorithm off the shelf, um, but you have lots of interfering problems about how do I now really do um, inference well? So how do I learn a Gaussian process model without all the time complexity issues? Um, and you run into all kinds of computational issues. Um, so if you read these papers, there's actually just a, a long list of kind of hacks to make good work. But it's actually kind of cool to see that these methods um, are kind of starting to work in the real world. So I've also left some references for you. This is kind of like a non-exclusive list and I'm sure somebody will complain because I forgot them. Uh, so these are all the papers that are somehow closely inspired by this, um, this path planning. I mean, there are lots of others. Um, just take this as a starting point rather than a concrete list. So with that, um, should want to conclude uh, pretty much on time. Uh, so if you want to do safe reinforcement learning, we've kind of seen lots of different um, ways to do this. And we started kind of with a normal Bayesian optimization, and then we kind of extended this to safe exploration and kind of found different ways to combine optimization with safe exploration. And then I kind of gave it like some pointers of how could we now extend these kind of simple models to more complicated settings and actually potentially end up with something that's both kind of um, applicable and you can actually do some uh, theory about and actually know that's going to work. So one thing I find interesting about uh, safe reinforcement learning is that you actually need expertise from a lot of different fields. So it's uh, so kind of components from machine learning, kind of the more classical control theory, formal methods that try to reason about usually known systems or systems that have bounded uncertainty. Um, there's a lot of approximate inference and decision theory, and then you still need statistics. So it's a really diverse field. So if you're looking for uh, a research topic, I can strongly recommend it. Um, and lastly, kind of, uh, if you have any questions um, after watching this video, um, not live, but uh, offline, 
Uh, you can find my contact details at my website there at the bottom. I'm happy to ask any questions. And also if you have some critical feedback of things that were unclear, that's always super valuable. So I'd also appreciate that. So with that, I'm done. Great. Are there any quick questions from the audience? Uh, yes, question. Yeah, uh, one at a time, please. Um, go ahead. Uh, I had a quick question about um, just, I just want to get your thoughts on how um, uh, you would deal with issues where the, the distribution of uncertainty is not necessarily Gaussian and you still have to have to deal with this uh, safety issue. Um, I, I, I don't know, like uh, whether there's a lot of work on, on learning separate kind of distributions or getting better models for that. Uh, yes, so there, um, it's actually a tricky problem, uh, so, or like a really interesting question. So the thing is, uh, in statistics, we've really, like, we, I mean, we understand the, the exponential family, we understand Gaussians, and I mean, anything sub-Gaussian is also fine. Um, so if you have a uniform distribution, the theory actually goes through, that's sub-Gaussian, that's fine. Um, but I, I guess you're asking about more uh, interesting things like heavy tails and all this. And there things uh, get really complicated. Right? And I think there's no good, like, I mean, people care about this, people are thinking about this, but it's also difficult. And I think this is like, if you really wanted to apply this in practice, this is where you move to approximate inference. Right? So where you, you no longer have a closed form posterior distribution, but you now kind of, uh, kind of include this prior or you know, over the noise where you kind of, you don't have a closed form posterior, you still want to compute a posterior, so you need to do approximate inference. And that's actually becomes the, in practice, this is one of the, if you really want to apply this, this is often one of the most challenging parts. Um, how do I actually do this inference really well and do it online so that's robust? Uh, I think there are also lots of, I mean, there's been immense progress. I think there's still lots of, um, but we're still quite a bit away from just plug and play inference um, to apply this on a real system. Okay, uh, last question, Ellen. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask a question um, going back to when you were talking about the bandit setting. Um, so you mm -hmm. talked about, um, Having a stopping condition for the um, for the algorithm when the width of the confidence interval shrinks, um, mm -hmm. and I was curious if there's an analogy to that for if you're just if you just really care about identifying the optimum safely, um, mm -hmm. so then you wouldn't really want to spend a lot of time shrinking the confidence intervals around the boundary of the safe set if you know that that's not where the optimum is, like in the goal-oriented example that that you gave. Um, so I was just curious how you would have a stopping condition for, for that for that case if you just want to identify the optimum safely. Well, so, I mean, the optimum, you might still have to learn about the safety um, of yeah. this optimum. I mean, so think of, the, I guess, the simplest setting would be where somebody actually tells me um, the objective function that I want to optimize and doesn't tell me about the safety, right? Um, so now I actually know where the optimum is, um, but I still don't know whether this optimum is safe, right? I don't know the constraint. So I still have to do a little bit of exploration um, in order to figure out um, whether this optimum is safe. And this actually nicely maps to this, this goal-oriented one where you kind of have a target. I mean, if you run optimization, it will tell you, I really want to go to this global optimum. And then you try to actively learn about the safety of that. And for that, you need to do some kind of goal-directed um, exploration. You probably don't want to learn about the entire safe set. Um, so, so this actually maps to that algorithm pretty nicely, I would say. Hey, great. Well, thank you so much, Felix, for taking the time. This was a really wonderful and comprehensive lecture. And uh, take care. All right. Thank you.